Welcome to Kingdom Culture. You may sit down, punch your neighbor, say, you better stay awake for this one. Come on, punch them harder a little bit. That was weak. Maybe you need to slap them. All the wives say, yes, amen. You didn't get that. It's all good. It's all good. Well, hey, if you're here with us, you're new with us, one of the things that we love to to do is talk back. I hope we can be in a conversation this morning. It's very uh, uh, hard to hear anything going on in this room. Everything, it's a movie theater, so you got to engage, okay? Remember, it's like we're on a phone call. I don't want to be the guy on the phone saying, are you still there? You you know why I say when I speak, are you you, you with me? Because you guys don't feel with me. So you got to engage. And, you know, I, I just, you know, in this whole process of like the waiting game, I was thinking about it this morning and I was on the way here early on driving in a snowstorm in spring. And I'm like, God, why? It seems like every Sunday, you know, like everyone stays home on these days. You know, you guys, you guys are the troopers. You guys are the hardcore. You guys really love God. <laughs> no, honestly, though, I, um, you know, I was praying and God was like, hey, remember your message today. It's all about the waiting. It's all about the waiting. Wait. It's, winter is still not over. Even though it says spring and we're, we're still experiencing the effects of winter. It's kind of like our life though, right? We know we're called to be living one thing, but we're experiencing the opposite. It's like for our own lives, it's like supposed to be spring, but we're still feeling winter. Anybody ever feel like that way? We're supposed to be prospering. We're, this is supposed to be the season, but yet we're still struggling in this area of our lives, right? We all go through seasons of, of that. And so, you know, happy spring. Happy spring. Um, you know, this also marks actually, funny, marks 11 years to the day almost April 1st, which I believe is tomorrow, right? April 1st, 11 years ago on April 1st, uh, Kingdom Culture as a organization became an official federally incorporated charity so it's a and it's not an april fool's joke but everything in my life has been kind of that way it's like it's the opposite it's like it sounds foolish how does this happen how are you breaking through in this area well it's kind of just been our life and so happy birthday kingdom culture as a ministry not as a church we haven't been that as a church but as a organizational as a, as a not-for-profit doing stuff all around the world really that's where we started and so we're just so thankful for what we've been able to be a part of. For time's sake today, I'm going to dive into this. If you're, you've been tracking with us, we've been in a season or a, a, seri- a teaching series called uh, Chapter 13. Hope you've been enjoying it. I've been enjoying it probably more than you have. Uh, because you know what? Like, if I don't eat what I'm feeding you every Sunday, it's, it's really irrelevant. It has to become a part of me. So I actually enjoy when I get to do, and we've never done, in all the years, we've never done a series on chapter 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, which if you've ever been to a wedding in your life, you've probably heard referenced at some point, okay? So without going through all of the uh, the last five weeks, because this is week six because of time, we're just going to jump into this because it seems like I'm, you know, this is the season, by the way, where movies are launching. So our timelines are a little bit more tight. So I have to be a little bit better at, and I, I'm not always amazing at this, getting everything out in time. So I have to like vomit all over you really quickly. It's going to be a quick vomit, right? So then we have time to clean up and get out of here. Sorry for the bad illustration. Uh, last year, if you were here, or last week, if you were here, we talked about something else I left you guys with. If you were here, you know what I'm talking about, but uh, this time it's vomit. Anyways, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, let's go there. We've been in this, and as I, I've said earlier, we've, you know, we're not exegetically breaking down verse by verse, but we're kind of flip-flopping, ping-ponging it. You know, we might hit verse 7, might go back to verse 3, you know, might do 1, 2, and 3 in a row in one session. So, but we're going to get through the majority of chapter 13, okay? So today, we're camping out in verse 4. Let's go there. I'm going to read it out of the New King James Version. It says in verse 4, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul, remember this, Paul the Apostle is writing to a dysfunctional church body, the church at Corinth, okay? And Lots of stuff's going on. There's, there, there's great supernatural things happening. The gifts of the Spirit are, are active. Incredible things are going on. But at the same time, there's all kinds of weird sexual immorality happening. People are sleeping with their stepmoms and just weird stuff. Like weird, kooky, kinky stuff is happening, okay? Like not cool in the kingdom stuff. 
And so he's addressing sort of a dysfunctional church at the same time, bringing them back to real foundational stuff, saying, guys, listen, you can have all this stuff and it's all good, but if you don't have love, you really have nothing. So this whole chapter is about centering, centering them back on the most important part of his whole letter, or both of his letters, is love, chapter 13. It says in verse 4, love suffers long. Say it with me. Say, suffers long. Love suffers long. If you've ever, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, as a woman in here, you're suffering long because your boyfriend still hasn't popped the question. I feel for you. You're suffering long. Long. It's hard. It's a hard road. When's he going to pop the question? Yes, we know men have commitment issues. Not all men. Not all men. Not all men. But I'm a man. I can say some of this. A lot of men. You know, or maybe it's the, the, vi the you know, vice versa. I know, you know, even though Michelle and I, we, we started really officially dating. I bought the engagement ring two weeks later. And we were married within nine months. I would never re recommend that to anybody unless you really know it's the right thing. And we knew it was a God thing. But, you know, our dating process, getting to know each other, was during a wedding plan. Like, uh, we're planning a wedding. And it was challenging. It had its own challenges. You know, but relationships can kind of feel like, and I, the word here says suffer, but really the word actually is patient. The word can actually, the, the, the relationships can feel like a test of patience, right? Even though our, our relationship was, was short, the pre-dating, the dating was short, okay? That short period tested our patience with each other because we had to get to know each other during that time. Planning a wedding is stressful, right? They say the three most stressful things in life are moving, planning a wedding, and having a baby. You know, most of us in this room have probably done two, or two of those, two of the three at the same time. Anybody moved and had a baby at the same time? We have multiple times. And it's stressful, right? It's intense. You need patience in those moments. You need patience. But Paul says, love suffers long and is kind. Because he knows if you don't have patience, probably the next thing that you won't have is kindness. You'll probably be so irritated because of your impatience that you're just mean, straight up mean to people. Anybody know some mean people? Okay. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and is not puffed up. Let me just read this in the New Living Translation. It says it like this. Love is patient and kind. Just camp there. We're going to stay there. We're going to camp out. We're going to build our tent. Love is patient and is kind. You don't have kindness really if you don't have patience. They kind of go together. They're like, they're, they're, they're married. They, they sleep in the same bed with each other, okay? Love is patient and love is kind. The most common definition of patience, write this down if you can or look at the screen, is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. It's a hard one, isn't it? Last week we talked about, you know, being irritable. Love is not irritable. Every one of the fruits or outcomes of love really is connected. They're all one big family, one big happy family. It's this capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or accept. It actually connects a lot to the, the original meaning of the word, connects to a, a word that actually means suffering. Because sometimes being patient feels like suffering, doesn't it? You're in the line, you're in a major, anybody ever feel like you're the day when you're in the biggest rush, you have the worst traffic? Or the day when you're in the biggest rush at the grocery store, there's that uh, nice woman or man in front of you that can't find their, you know, their PC Plus card or can't find the change they need or whatever or drops the change on the ground or forgets the wallet in the car. You know what I'm talking about? Like the day you need patience the most usually is the day you're tested with it the most. It's just the way that life works. The Greek word in this passage in the original manuscript, actually means to be long-tempered or to defer anger. So to be patient is to be long-tempered. 
It means to refuse to retaliate with anger because of human reasoning. It means to extend itself a long time. Really, it's the opposite of being quick-tempered. It's long-spirited. That's what the word patience means. I want to be long-spirited. Who wants to be long-spirited? You know, if you want to have kids, you have to be long-spirited. If you want to have good relationships, you have to be long-spirited, right? It just comes with the territory. If you want to live a hermit alone, by yourself, never come out of your, your cave, then you don't need much patience. You just need patience for yourself. But when you're doing life with people, it's messy. It's gross. It's, it's challenging. It, there's opposition. It's, there's conflict. There's, 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 there's so much stuff that goes in and on in relationships that if you don't have patience... You're just not going to have good relationships in life. I mean, as a pastor doing what I do, I have to have patience with how slow it takes you to get a revelation sometimes. Just joking. Every single week. No, I'm just joking. But honestly, it's part of it, right? It, it's, it's, it's part of it. You can teach the same thing over and over again to your kids even, and they just don't get it. But honestly, all of us, okay, it's no different in the church. And I'm not just talking about from me to you. I'm talking about from you to me, from me to you, from God to us. Like, God is the most patient person. It, it, on the, it, he, he's still waiting for you to get your act together. He's still waiting for you to believe him and trust him. He's still waiting for you to stop remembering how things, how all those bad things in your past and remember the fact that he's forgiven you. He's still waiting for you to get a hold of just the basic truth of what it means to have relationship with. And he's patient. He's okay. It's okay. There's no condemnation. But man, patience really is one of the greatest reflections of love. And we need it for each other, don't we? You know, at the beginning of the week, I kept feeling this. I, I kept, you know, it was around, I think, Monday. I, I was thinking about this Sunday, and I kept feeling like, what's the subject for this Sunday? What's the focus? Sometimes... I feel like God will speak to me like weeks before. Sometimes it's like, you know, I could fight through the whole week and Saturday night change the whole thing. Like it, it never, I never know. I've been even, even I've come up on the platform. As I get up here, he changes the whole thing. And I have no idea what I'm going to say. It's happened, right? I love it when he speaks to me a little bit earlier though. It's a lot easier. So on Monday, I felt like I had this phrase, the long game. The long game. Because patience really is about the long game, right? Playing the long game. I had this word, the long game. And, uh, so I was, I was looking at, and I was reading 1 Corinthians 13, and I was looking at this phrase, patience, and I was thinking of the long game. And then two nights, two days later, two nights later, I had this dream. And in the dream, uh, I was, Michelle and I were late for church. I'm not going to go through all the details of the, of the dream. But we were late for church, and, uh, and, and we walk in, and it was, like, it was packed, okay? It wasn't like this, okay? It was like packed. There was lines outside. We were like, what's happening? It was a like complete shock, you know? And it's thinking, man, this is what it would feel like for people to be excited about church. You know, there was like, I, I knew when I came in, there was like something really significant, special happening. Like the, the gathering, I mean, it was crazy, you guys. The feeling, the environment, there was lineups, people were waiting to get in, and our host team was like slowly ushering them in in sections because there was just too many people at the same time. And it was just crazy. You could hear the music, and then the scene shifted, and I'm walking out with my wife, and we're still walking into like where the experience was happening, but it was like all of a sudden it was from, moved from like an auditorium, and it moved to... Uh, uh, there's some details I'm leaving out because I don't want to get into this whole, it's going to take a long time. So I get, we get it, and all of a sudden I see there's a baseball game playing, and the, the, the church actually is in the, the, like on the diamond, and its own like quarantined area in the middle of the baseball game. And there was a connection. And I was like, well, this is so weird. And I was asking Matt, and I'm like, how, Matt was there, and I was like, how, how are we going to get the people in? Because Matt has the answer for everything usually. How are we going to do this? He's like, we're going to put tarp over that. Yeah, this whole thing. Anyways, it was really interesting. And then all of a sudden, I'm on this, like, high, high point. And I'm with all of some of our leaders, and we're at this high point. And I'm looking down at the game, and I'm like, man, the game's going on. The church is in the game. It's crazy. And I'm thinking to myself, baseball. And you know what's interesting? And I, once again, I'm not going to go all the, through all the details. One of the longest sports games that you can watch is actually the baseball game. It's, it's inning-focused and not necessarily time-focused, right? 
you know, there's been on record, I think the longest baseball game ever was, it was two days. It lasted eight hours. You can read about it. Um, the it, it, Games can last from three to five hours, depending. I mean, even to the place where, you know, the, the major league, you know, actually has had to try or tried to attempt it to put different timelines and change some things and, you know, speed things up because people, it's a long game. It's a long game. And interestingly enough, though, in a three-hour, okay, because the average game could be three hours, in a three-hour baseball game, there's only 17 minutes of action. They've done studies where they've timed, like, the action. Yeah, it sounds so dull. It's kind of like golf. Actually, I, I played competitive baseball. I love baseball, but I never, I couldn't watch it. Just like I could never watch golf. I don't know why anybody wants to watch golf. But, but, or soccer. Like, what? Soccer. Like, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or football, whatever you want to call it in Brazil. So, uh, honestly, um, so I, I, you know, I, I love baseball, but so 17 minutes and only five minutes of those 17 minutes is like, you know, balls being hit, runners running around the bases, and a few other things. The other 12 minutes is like pitching. It's like, it's like even the slower actionable stuff foul balls, 17 minutes of action. But that's kind of like a lot of our lives, right, sometimes? We feel like we spend so much time waiting for the things that God's promised us, and there's very little action. And we get frustrated, don't we? So I have this dream two days after I'm feeling this word, the long game, like, hey, this is it. I know what I need to do. So if you're taking notes, write this down, playing the long game. Playing the long game. I want to talk about developing passionate patience. Passionate patience. Let me read a scripture out of 2 Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 5. So don't lose a minute in building on what you've been given. I love this. Complementing your basic faith with good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, and what? Say it with me. Passionate patience. We need to be passionate about developing patience in our life. You know what? God's love is like passionate patience for us. That even in the midst of our stupidity, we reject Him. We close the door. God tries to get our attention. We say, no, that's not you. We don't want you. We want to live life our own way, our own God. Be in, in control. The reality of it is, like, you can think that all you want. There is a God who loves you so much and has been trying to make His way into your life. And maybe because of fear, pride, whatever the case may be, you've been pushing him out. But he's never going to stop trying. That's the most amazing thing about love. Love doesn't force itself on anybody. It simply gives an invitation. It's the invitation to the wedding. You don't have to come to the wedding, but you get to. You've been invited. Just make sure you RSVP before you die. It's basically what, <laughs> what Jesus wants us to decide. Like at least decide when you're on your deathbed because by then, I'd be a little bit too late. Let me in. He wants to be in. It says, add and complement to your basic faith, good character, spiritual understanding, alert discipline, passionate patience, reverent wonder, reverent wonder, warm friendliness, and generous love. Each dimension fitting into and developing the others. They all connect. With these qualities active and growing in your lives, no grass will grow under your feet. No day will pass without its reward as you mature in your experience of our Master Jesus. Without these qualities, you can't see what's right before you, oblivious that your old sinful life has been wiped off the books. In other words, without a passionate patience in your life, you can't disconnect yourself from the things that used to hold you bound. And as a result, you can't move forward. Without these things as a platform in your life that you sit on, that you stand on in life, there will be no ability for you to mature into all that you're called to mature into. We need to have a, a passion for developing passionate patience. It changes the game for everything in our life. Some of you have been, you know, believing for people in your life to encounter God for the first time. Some of you have siblings 
maybe that are just totally anti-Jesus, anti, you know, anti-church because people often clump Jesus in with the church because the church is screwed up. The church hasn't been perfect. The church has hurt people. They say, oh, it must be God. But don't, don't put your judgments on people and let them be a reflection of who God really is. Because people are human. They do stupid stuff all the time. We all do stupid stuff, right? I mean, it's just part of relationship. Love is patient. I want to explore really quickly. I want to explore the tensions between us living in passionate patience and the lifestyle of the quick fix. Because we live in a culture of drive through Everything's quick, right? I mean, we don't really need patience anymore. Especially if you're a Tim Hortons person. You don't need patience. They press a button, you get an espresso shot. Which is the complete abomination to espresso. <laughs> press a button. It's like, what is that? It's like, you know, yeah. Just, it's, it's like pure sin. They need deliverance. I go to Tim Hortons. I'm like, can I have a shot? They're like, what? Because they, it's not even in their in vocabulary because, you know, no one's pulling shots. They're pressing buttons. Some of you don't get that. Anyways, it's okay. We'll move on. I want to talk about the difference between there's three key tensions or temptations that we all face in, in the attempt of developing passionate patience in our life, playing the long game of life. Number one, write this down. We have this tension between band-aids or blessings. It's very easy to live life with band-aid solutions, right? We get cut up, we want to put a band-aid on it. Sometimes letting it air out is the best way for it to heal. I tell my kids all the time when they hurt themselves, they want the band-aid. They think the band-aid's cool. They think the band-aid's going to like heal the wound. Yeah, it might protect it from getting more damage. And there's an element of obviously we need to have the protection. You don't want to keep damaging it. But it's not what's necessarily going to heal the wound. It's really time. It's time. And we can get so fixated on band-aiding everything in our lives because things aren't working rather than waiting it out in patience for the better blessing in the end. There's always a better blessing. You know, in, in Matthew 11 verse, uh, Matthew 11 verse uh, 6, it actually says in, in and you know, it's going to be on the screen, but in the context of John the Baptist, okay, he is sending, he's in jail, he's sending his disciples to see if Jesus really is the guy, really is the guy who he says he is, really is the Messiah, really is the Son of God. And Jesus sends uh, the guys back to John who's in jail to give them this report but Jesus at the end of the report says to the disciples say guys listen blessed is he who's not offended by me if you can be patient in the midst of offense opposition conflict things that are contradicting everything that you think or say you believe if you can be patient then then you can be blessed if you can overcome offense you can be blessed that word for blessing literally means elongated it means like a strength of blessing it means large and in charge. If you want to become large and in charge in life, you need patience. And you can't use Band-Aid solutions for things because Band-Aid solutions is not a reflection of a patient, pers a patient person. A Band-Aid solution is a quick fix to deal with the problem that may actually end up not dealing with, with itself longer because you don't let it air. You don't, you don't deal with it properly. Are you with me? Proverbs 14, verse 21 says, whoever is patient has great understanding. I want great understanding. Whoever is patient has great understanding. And how many know, like, band-aids can be hard to rip off, can't they? You get loose to living a band-aid in life. If you leave a band-aid on too long, not only does it smell, and everyone smells it. You ever smelt your finger? It's disgusting. <laughs> Like, even saying it, I want to, uh, I want to, like, vomit, you know? You ever smelt your finger after Pat's had a Band-Aid on it? It's nasty. Because he kept it on too long. You can't, but the thing is, after you keep it on too long, let's say on your skin somewhere, it leaves that, like, you know, that glue mark or whatever. It, it gets, you, uh, it gets, you, after a while, you want to take it off because you know it's just going to get harder and harder to take it off. That's kind of what it's like in life. You know, we can band-aid things in our life and we kind of find quick fixes for things in life and we can get used to the quick fix rather than waiting it out for the better blessing in the end. Because we're afraid to deal with the things that are needing to be dealt with. I love what Romans 3, verse 5. Actually, let me tell you a quick story. Can I tell you a quick story? I, I always, I love one of my favorite stories of the last season, just of 
God's cool faithfulness was how I got an $8 barbecue. I got an $8, okay, six burner Weber, brand new gas barbecue, $8. How is that even possible? Let me just tell you, the God that I know, my friend, he's the, the, the man that does the impossible. He majors in the impossible. It's his like, it's not just his BA, it's like he's got a PhD in the impossible. Okay, so here, here I am, you know, we, we moved into this new place and I sold my barbecue, the last barbecue that I had and we had a gas hookup outside so I was waiting and, and we just didn't really have the, the money to buy a barbecue. So I decided to, rather than band-aid it, just find a barbecue on Kijiji, you know, uh, find a barbecue that I didn't really want just to kind of band-aid it because, you know, we have four kids. So I'm like thinking long term, barbecue should last a long time. We need space. And my last barbecue just wasn't enough space. So if we have, if we're hosting, we need a big barbecue. I want a party barbecue. I want the party barbecue. Okay. So, so I, we're waiting and, and I, I searched it and we could have bought one at one point, like a GG and it was like, okay, I didn't, I wasn't happy with it. And how you know we settle often, right? It's like band-aid solutions. We just settle for what we don't really want based out of need. But I'm like, God, you really know how much I want a good barbecue. I'm thinking like legacy here. Like I want to leave my barbecue for the next generation, you know, like come on, like it should last a long time. And so we're praying and I, I think we waited, we waited for almost two years, and like a year and a half, almost two years, and we were waiting and uh, somebody had given me $627 to buy a barbecue. Here, here's, here's some money, $627 to buy, to buy a barbecue. And so I was thinking now, oh, that's amazing. What, a, like, what an awesome gift, you know? And I'm like, I, I don't really know because the barbecue that I want, started, as I started looking into it, the barbecue that I wanted was like way more than that. And I'm like, okay, what should I do? Should I just get the, the smaller barbecue and then kind of get bite the bullet, not enough space, you know? We kind of waited it out and I searched and searched and searched and eventually I came to the conclusion out for church one day. We were actually here, I think at this venue at this point. Uh, we were just visiting and we're trying it out. And I went to the Home Depot just down the street here after church one day. And uh, I found this this black Weber gas barbecue. It was a three burner. And it was like, I think it was like eight ninety nine, brand new gas. And I'm like, it was more than the six twenty seven that I had to buy. But I'm like, man, it's still small. Like, it's just so small, but it's awesome. Weber's like, you know, awesome, right? You know? And so... Um, so I, I was like looking at it. I'm like, guess we're going to buy this on the phone with my wife. Should we do it? I, I, but I didn't really want it still. You know what I mean? It's not, I felt like a Band-Aid solution. I'm just going to do it. And it's $900. I don't even want it. It's more than the money that I have to buy the barbecue. I don't even really want it. I'm not excited about it. So I'm like, here I am. I'm like back and forth with the sales guy on the phone with my wife. I get some sort of like, do we feel good about this? Should we do it? Is this the right barbecue? Um, and, uh, and so we're, as I'm on the phone, this guy comes out, this sales guy, he's like, actually, he's like, come here for a second. He shows me on the computer. He's like, I found, I didn't know we had this, but um, I, I have a brand new, still in the box, brand new black, the exact same barbecue as the one you want, but it's a six burner. It's a six burner. It's brand new, gas, everything you want, but it's double the size. It was actually the one I want. It brand new was worth, I think it was like $15.99. He's like, I'll give it to you for $635. I'm like, whoa, 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 it didn't even make any sense. It's like, okay, I'm gonna, about to buy an $899 barbecue that's half the size. It's the exact same barbecue, but half the size. And you have one in a box still, not on display, that they didn't even know they had any, any more of. In the box still, that's worth over $1,500. And you want to give it to me for $635, less than the one that I want to buy that's half the, half the size? He's like, yeah. You want to get rid of it. It's the last one we have. So I, I ate, it cost me $8, more than I had six. They, they, they drove it to my house, set it up for free for $8, plus tax. But what God showed me in that is like, Sean, you could have band-aided it, went and bought a barbecue, or you could have, if you, but because you waited it out, you waited for the blessing. I look at that barbecue. That barbecue is a blessing, man. It's a good barbecue. I just like looking at it. I'm like that guy. I just like looking at it. It's so nice, you know. <laughs> James 1 verse 3 says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
Sometimes the greatest tests of our faith are not to go the band-aid solution. In times of trouble, in times of like pressure, to just like go the band-aid solution sometimes robs us of the bigger blessing in the end. I was listening to this business podcast recently and there was this um, very, very well-known, successful uh, uh, um, businessman that was in this business meeting and you had to be in the meeting, you had to have made, you had to be uh, at least a million dollars or above uh, in, your, in your business to, to be in the meeting. And uh, it was like a, a special, you know, class for business people. And this guy who was very busy, who's like grown multiple businesses, um, was asked the question uh, from a businessman in the audience. They said, you know, we know that you're like so busy. You're putting out all this stuff. Like you're like, you're rocking it. You're killing it in business. Like it's amazing to see what you've been able to grow. He's like, how much like, how much do you work? Like how, what, what's your, your daily hours like? And what's your schedule like? Because it must be crazy. And you know what his answer was? His answer was, you know, it's probably going to offend a lot of you. He's like, I get up, I have coffee, I meditate, I go outside, walk around, look at nature. And he's like, I wait. He's like, it'll take like three weeks to do this. He's like, I wait. And I basically wait in patience to find the one big domino that if I push this domino over, all the other little things will follow. Because I've learned that if I can find the one big thing that creates the momentum for all the little small things, I don't have to stress myself out so much about my task list and my schedule. This like rocked me. It's like, wow. So in patience, rather than band-aiding everything and trying to stress out about everything, he waits in patience. What's that one thing? If I can knock that one domino over, it's going to revolutionize everything else. And that's how he lives as a businessman. And that's what he attributes his success to. I thought that was really interesting for us. Really interesting for us. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 says, finishing is better than starting. I love that. We can get so fa- passionate about starting, but you do not need patience to start something often. You need patience to sustain it, keep believing that it's going to complete itself to the end. Patience is really found in the middle, not at the beginning. Energy, vision, passion, all those things are at the beginning of any project, but to see it through, you need patience. You need perseverance. You need a love for the why you're doing what you're doing. Sticking it, sticking to it is always better than quitting in the middle. Number two, number two, problems or persuasion, two tensions that we live in. Problems or persuasion. You might, you might be thinking, what, do you, what does that even mean? Well, all of us come into every week. Tomorrow you're going to go back to work and you're probably going to encounter a problem at some level, Right? could be a problem with your boss, a problem with a coworker, a problem with a project. Something's not moving forward. You know, the same thing that you've tried to launch, you know, three times has failed again. You're, you're coming into a problem, okay? And, and oftentimes what's behind the problem are people. Because people, listen, you, you, you can't, there is no purpose in life without people. You aren't even able to fulfill your purpose in life, your God-given purpose, without the people around your life. Everybody in this room is connected somehow to your purpose, whether you know it or not. There's some sort of connection. The people in your life have a connection to you fulfilling your purpose. You can either deal with problems in an impatient way or be patient and see the persuasion of that problem turn a corner. Let me read a scripture for you in Proverbs 25 verse 15. It says, by patience and a calm spirit, a ruler may be persuaded. And a soft and gentle tongue breaks the bone of resistance. You know that if you're having a hard time right now with your manager at work, a coworker, your spouse, a close friend, one of the greatest antidotes for that problem, to persuade the problem from becoming a problem to something beneficial, to change and transformation is patience. I love how it says here, it says, by patience and a calm spirit, a ruler may be persuaded. You want to change the heart of your leader? Be patient. Be patient. Impatience will sabotage your position in any environment. Impatience will sabotage your position in any working environment, any family dynamic, 
any relationship, impatience will always sabotage you and sabotage your position. Are you here? Are you listening? It says that in the Passion Translation, the same scripture, it says use patience and kindness when you want to persuade leaders and watch them change their minds right in front of you. Love that. For your gentle wisdom will quell the strongest resistance. Write this down. Patience is perspective while you're under pressure. Patience, if I can give it a definition, is perspective while you're under pressure. The sign of patience is when you're under pressure and you're being crushed and you're being pressed is that you have a healthy perspective. It's a sign of patience. That you see right. Even though you shouldn't see right, there's no reason why you should see right. You just have this healthy ability to see while everything around you is pushing you the wrong way. There's pressure points and you feel uncomfortable and you feel like it's just, you're bothered and you have that like that weird pain in the back and something's pressing on you and you can't kick it. If you can have perspective while you're in it, you'll be able to advance through it. Overcome it. And I, I let me read it out of Proverbs 19, verse 11. I love this. It's the piggyback with Proverbs 25, chapter 19, verse 11. A wise person demonstrates patience. For mercy means holding your tongue. When you are insulted, be quick to forgive and forget it. For you are virtuous when you overlook an offense. Wisdom is always connected to patience. Understanding is always connected to patience. Perspective is always connected to patience. Patience, are you getting this? is such a key factor in you fulfilling the purpose and living out and playing the long game in life because every one of us in this room have a long game to complete. That purpose is like the long game in our life. I remember this, this I want to show this quickly. I was in this, I was in a Ponderosa in, uh, in the U.S., okay? This is years ago before I had a revelation of eating. I was in Ponderosa. And um, no condemnation for you, those of you like Ponderosa. I was in Ponderosa, and, and it's like the Denny's of America, right? Or at least it was. I don't even know if it still exists anymore. This is like years ago. And so this is about 15 years ago. And I was in Ponderosa, and I was sharing. And um, back then, like I did, once again, I didn't look the part. I was still fresh on the block, believing in Jesus. I had big, long dreadlocks. I used to wear a big dread, a dread tam. I looked like a Rastafarian. Everywhere I went, people like would be like, respect man and like they'd you know they'd, they'd like off, offer me some marijuana like it was just a normal thing you know and, and I had like big long go goatee big thick earrings everywhere and, and it just I didn't look the part so I was in this Ponderosa and I was still I was maybe like two years walking with Jesus at the point or maybe like a year and a half and there was this guy there was this guy I was meeting with and I was sharing with this guy this amazing encounter that I had like God was like doing amazing things in my life and I'm sharing this like crazy 48 hour visitation that I had in Toronto and and I was it was crazy I was, I was sharing this and I could feel you know when you're at a restaurant and you could feel somebody listening in to your conversation even though he was kind of far away I could feel his like spiritual ear growing bigger and bigger and kind of like entering our table and I'm like Ooh, what's going on like someone's listening to my conversation and so I kept speaking and this guy came over about like three quarters of the way through the conversation interrupted my conversation and said, excuse me, sir, um, what, like, what was happening to you in that experience? Like, where, where did you have that experience that I began to share with them? He looks at me. It's a stranger. He's like, that's not God. He's like, that's witchcraft. That's magic. He's just like, I don't even know this guy, okay? You got to understand, at this point, I was a lot more raw and rugged in my approach, okay? I was in people's faces. Like, I, I still had a little bit of, like, I was like a I was like a, a spiritual MMA fighter in a sense. Like, you don't mess with me and then it comes to this stuff, okay? I was immature still then, okay? So I had no problem having confrontations, okay? Anyways, it got so intense. First of all, because I was so thrown off guard. I'm like, who are you? I'm like, you don't, even know, you don't even know who I am. Like, what are you talking about? You only heard a part of the conversation. It got so intense, the manager of the restaurant came out and said, excuse me, people, can you please keep it down or I have to ask you to leave? So now the manager is threatening to kick us out. And I wouldn't recommend, like, don't, like this is like back in my like early days, okay? Like, don't think it's cool or more spiritual because you have this happen to you. Uh, and so I, I, I'm having this go on. And I'm like, I apologize to the manager. And I said, hey, listen to the guy. I said, listen, why don't we connect for coffee after this and we can have a conversation? 
So I gave him my number. I didn't think he was going to call me. This is, I li I'm living in Minneapolis at the time, okay? I don't know who this guy is. I don't know where he's from, what his background is, why he's even having an issue. Actually, I do now. He was a Baptist guy. So I'm like, oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. We love the Baptists. But I get it. I was in that world. I get it. I, I can talk to anybody about this stuff. Baptist, Alliance, Catholic, you know, everybody in the zoo of Christianity. I can talk to all the animals in the zoo. I'm like Aquaman for animals. I can talk to all the animals. And so, uh, anyways, so I, uh, this guy calls me like two weeks later or a week later. He's like, let's meet. So we go to this coffee shop, one of my favorite coffee shops called Caribou Coffee. And uh, back in the day, I went to the coffee shop. And we sat in this booth and like he just reamed me out like for like the first 20 minutes. And God spoke to me and said, before I went in, he said, I want to break some stuff. I want to break some, I saw that, I saw chains breaking off this guy. He said, I want to break some stuff. He's like, the, the table is going to turn for you. Just listen. Don't argue, because I used to be the big, like, arguer. Like, you get me into, like, we'll argue. We'll debate it out. And uh, so he's just, like, God's like, just listen. So I listened. He, like, read me out, told me all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, I was, I was into magic. I was into witchcraft, all these different things. And um, listen, now, we begin to talk, and I understand I know the word, right? And he was talking about, well, I know the word, and I have the experience to back the word. I don't just know the word in my mind. I know it here, because I've experienced it. Big difference. You can know something up here doesn't change you. But when you know it here, because it's changed your life, totally different experience. So we were talking, by the end of, I'm just going to fast forward, by the end of the two and a half to three hour conversation, okay, he actually gave me money. He donated money. I didn't even have enough for profit. Donated money to go on to this mission that at the beginning of the conversation didn't even believe was a good thing and didn't want me to, didn't said to me, actually, I don't even believe you should do that. It's not a God thing. You shouldn't go. This guy's like, this guy that I was going with is like, he's out there, you know, you shouldn't go. He's a false prophet, all these different things. He actually, by the end of the conversation, the tables turned. He, he was so persuaded by the love of God and the patience that his whole theology and doctrine changed in one moment. And ended up sowing into me, who he at the beginning didn't even believe in, to go on to a trip he didn't believe I should go on. It just goes to show you when you're patient with people, God can work on their heart. God can come in and persuade their heart a little bit and help them to see a different perspective and help their heart to soften a little bit, to open up to what he wants to do. Patience. Number three, last point, and then we're done. We wrestle between pleasure now or purpose later. Pleasure now or purpose later. Man, we wrestle with this, don't we? I know for me, like in the last year and a half, I've been on this like health and fitness thing. You know, I've been competing in these regional competitions. And I know the last prep for me was so intense. It was so intense. And like in this world, like you're eating six meals a day. Everything's, everything's tracked. Everything's like you don't have, and like the eight weeks leading up to the show, I had no fruit for eight weeks. My sugars are super low. I'm low on carbs. I'm irritated. I'm impatient. Because, <laughs> you know, you don't realize how much of your mood is affected by what you eat until you stop eating certain things that you're, you're familiar with eating. And so, you know, in, in this process, like I would always battle with, if I do this, if I eat this one chocolate chip, like one little chocolate chip, I'm gonna wanna eat the whole bag. Because for me, it's like that. Like I'm all in, I'm an all in guy. If, if, if I have a cheat meal, like after my last competition, Matt and Jan were there. After my last competition, like I hadn't eat, eaten any cheat meal for eight weeks, I mean, it was crazy. Sunday mornings, so the day after, we were like celebrating my birthday and we had like pizza, wings, I, had, I wanted pie because I hadn't had pie in forever. So we had like two or three pies, a chocolate dessert. We had, I think, donuts. We had um, nachos. I mean, we went all board. And because my mindset is like, I can eat it all. And literally, you guys, I ate so much that my left side of my abdomen popped out and it was bloated. Only on the left side, it was like bloated, okay? <laughs> And I was so I was so in pain. I was leaving to LA the next day, and I was trying to say that to my kids. I couldn't even talk. I, I, I like they were talking to me. I had to whisper because knowing you're really full, you can't you can't. So I was like, I was like, I love you. I love you guys. I'll see you in a week. I, I couldn't talk to them. It was I was so bloated. It, only the left side. It was like my abdomen had popped out. It was so uncomfortable. But I just went all out because that just happens, right? But it, it makes us realize, you guys, listen, like, if we want to have and achieve purpose in life, we have to sacrifice sometimes pleasure for the now. 
Man, that was the most pleasurable moment. I, I wanted to just feast and just feast and feast. And my mind was like, Sean, you can eat it all. And my stomach was like, please stop, please stop. My mind was like, no, Sean, you can eat it all. And my stomach was like, please stop, please stop. And at the end, my stomach won. My mind was wrong and I learned my lesson. But pleasure now or purpose later. Pleasure now or purpose later. It's a big, it's a big challenge that we all face big challenge that we all face. I love what it says in Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Speaking to the church of Philadelphia, it says this, because you kept my word in passionate patience, I'll keep you safe in times of testing. <laughs> you want purpose to protect your life? Sacrifice pleasure for the now. <laughs> Someone's getting it in the back. Stand up with me.